So uh, what do we do last time? Last time we talked about root finding. Um, we talked about Newton's method. I guess we also talked about uh, you know, fixed point iteration and, and gradient descent, right, as being like alternative options to Newton, but I would say strictly inferior options. If you can afford to do Newton, you should do Newton. And then we talked about um, you know minimization, right? And the kind of train of thought there is we did root finding first. These are algorithms for root finding at the end of the day. And then we bootstrapped on top of that by turning minimization into root finding, right? So this is like a key concept. I think that's extremely, you know, worth getting in your head and, and making sure this distinction is clear, right? Like Newton's method is a root finding algorithm, not a minimization or maximization algorithm. And we bootstrapped on top of root finding by using those first order necessary conditions, aka gradient equals zero conditions to like use it to do minimization. But we then kind of show these like, you know, kind of bad things that can happen if you do that naively, because hey, maxima are also grad equals zero points. And sometimes you'll go uphill instead of downhill. So remember like kind of the answer for this was regularization, right? And um, this is important. And then I kind of left you hanging at the end of last time with this kind of, we solved the, you know, the go up versus downhill problem with regularization. But there's this one last annoying issue with applying Newton's method naively to nonlinear non-convex problems, which is, again, everything we care about, uh, um, at least in here. And that is this kind of overshoot thing we saw at the end of last time, right, where we, we went downhill, but we dramatically overshot the bottom. It turns out, in general, that can cause you to diverge and, like, never make it to the answer, right? You can, you can easily imagine cooking up examples very much like the one we did, where if I made that thing totally symmetric, it would bounce back and forth forever and never actually go all the way down to the bottom, right? So this can happen. But today, right now, we're going to talk about the answer to, you know, that problem. It turns out there's actually a couple flavors of this answer to fix the overshoot problem. Um, you guys probably heard about some of these. We're going to talk about one in specific uh, detail, which is I, the simplest version of this that actually works, that gets you like provable local convergence. So today we're going to first talk about line searches. Um, who's done this before? Anybody? A couple people? Who, who knows the other main category of ways of doing this, fixing this problem that isn't a line search? There's sort of two broad categories of what are called globalization strategies for Newton's method to fix this overshoot thing. There's line searches and there's one other big one. Anyone know? No, I'm no, it's still Newton's method, but like fixing the overshoot problem specifically. Is it conjugate gradient? Nope. CG is uh, is a linear system solver technique. Um, well, you, there are nonlinear versions of it, but often actually you use conjugate gradient to solve the uh, the Newton linear system. So there's a so-called um, approximate Newton's method or uh, or Newton CG, where you actually use conjugate gradient inside of Newton, which is like a common thing. But anyway, sorry. Uh, anybody else have any ideas? Yeah. So that's basically what line searches do. Um, and that's that step size decay thing it turns out is like a very much a machine learning stochastic thing that is generally a terrible thing to do uh, if you have like a deterministic problem. Um, and line searches are much better. Line searches are basically the legit version of, of like learning rate decay. And we'll, we'll see that in a sec. Yeah. Nope. So these, these like Newton and gradient design, actually you can both potentially have this overshoot problem and you can use this for, for both of them. Uh, I feel like the, my lab's my lab crew should know the answer to this, but that's all right. Um, so the answer is the other one, which I'm sure many of you heard of, is our trust region methods. Has anyone heard of trust region methods? Maybe for the RLML folks in the context of TRPO, trust region policy optimization. So that's the other sort of broad category of of methods. You can talk more about this. I'm just you know going on a tangent, but you know I do that sometimes. Sorry. Okay, so we're going to talk about that as a quick just finish off last time stuff and then we're going to start getting into constrained uh optimization and in this class it's always going to be minimization so i'll just say constrained minimization the rl people like to maximize but this is the optimal control comes first here so we're, we're minimizers I've heard people argue that that makes like 
that, that like optimal control people are pessimistic and RL people are optimistic as they like sort of disagree with, but you know. Okay, cool. So let's do the line search thing. Um, okay, so as we saw at the end of last time, and we'll do this again in a minute. So if you weren't here and missed that, trust me. Um, often your delta x step for Newton, or I, again, this equally applies to gradient descent or any any other algorithm, right? Because it's ultimately based on some kind of local approximation, it's easy to overshoot the answer. Um, so the way we fix this, again, there are multiple ways, but this one's, we're going to do the easiest fix that actually works in practice. Um, the basic intuition is you just check the step. So you plug it into the, your, your function, you do F of X plus Delta X, and then you do what's called backtracking, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, until I put these in quotes and then we'll do the, the math version that is rigorous um, until we get a quote good reduction uh, in F, right? And again, yeah, there, there are many, many strategies for doing this. Um, even just, so the, the two big ones are line search, trust region, but inside those, there's a bajillion like you know, sub variants of both ideas. Um, so when the one we're going to talk about is a backtracking line search, it's the simplest one that actually works, and it's called the Armijo rule. Anyone heard of this before? Okay, crickets. Okay, cool. We're doing new things. That's good. All right, so here's how this works. Um, so the backtracking thing is what it sounds like. It means, you know, you got your step. You're just going to like shrink the step size and backtrack along that step direction until you get something reasonable. So to do that, we're going to define a step length. If you're a real hardcore ML person, you would call this a learning rate. You know, same idea. We're going to set this to one at the beginning of this, this exercise. So it's, it's called the step length. We, we will not call it a learning rate. Uh, okay, cool. And then we do this whole business. So we say, while um, we're going to check some condition, I'm going to write it down and then we'll talk about what it means and like why this is a reasonable thing to check. We're going to check F of X plus alpha times delta X. So if alpha is one, you're getting the full Newton step. And then what you basically do is cut alpha down and shrink the step length, but you still step in the delta X, you know, Newton direction. Okay, so if this... Um, you want to, you want to, you want this to ultimately be smaller than the following ap approximation. Okay, and let's label some of these things. So, um, does anyone like, if you stare at that for a minute, can anyone tell me what that that second thing is? So this we're going to call uh, like tolerance. That's a B. Yeah, that's a little B. Sorry, I'll I'll try to make that less terrible. Let's try again. It is not a, a magic constant. We don't like magic constants. Magic constant's bad. It is a letter B. Hopefully that's slightly better. Do so you want to try to go with a beta? Would beta be better? I don't know. Yeah. You said that that approximation is smaller than or yeah, so can anyone tell me what the, the the thing on the right of the inequality there? Does anyone have any intuition for what that is? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. So that thing on the right is the first order Taylor expansion of, you know, what we expect the, the new step to, to be, right? So what this condition is saying is that I want the actual step, you know, so the F of X plus alpha delta X, that's the actual step. I want that to agree with the first order Taylor expansion within some tolerance, which is the B. Does that make sense, everybody? Should I call that? I'm going to call it beta, unless I'm being terrible and I use beta somewhere else. Does that make does that make everyone happy? It's not a six. 
we'll do that. That seems like a better, better move. Okay, tolerance. And then this whole thing over here, if you like think about this for a really, just, just you know, for a second, this is the expected decrease reduction from the gradient, right? From a first order Taylor expansion of F. That makes sense to everybody? Okay, and so basically what this is saying is you have some tolerance on here. And if the actual reduction isn't within the tolerance of what you expected from your Taylor expansion, then you reject the step and you shrink the step. And in the limit as beta goes, or in the limit as alpha goes to zero, so your step length, right? As long as F is smooth, which is always an assumption with this stuff because we're always doing gradients and Hessians and whatever, in the limit as alpha gets chopped all the way down towards zero, this becomes an equality, right? Like it's just the definition of Taylor expansion. So for really small step lengths, that first order Taylor expansion is exact, right? So the, the reason this works is that you can always, as long as the function is smooth and like benign-ish, you know, you can always make, make this work for a sufficiently small alpha. Does that make sense to everybody? It's like a reasonable thing to do. It won't break. Yeah. So is beta changing? Oh, sorry. Why why not just use the second part of the equation for your for your equation? It's if you're getting back to it anyway. So the reason you do this is so first you do Newton, you get this delta x step, right? That delta x step is strictly better than a gradient step. It's got like more information, blah, blah, blah. What you're doing though is you're saying, I don't want to take that full step if it like is way off if the so I, I used the gradient to compute the step, right? The gradient is the thing that I'm, it's one of the pieces, right? Mm -hmm. This is, um, so Armijo is the simplest one. It's a first order version that only uses the gradient. There is a second order version of these things or a few called the Wolf conditions that use the Hessian as well. So those might be more Newton flavored in that they use also the second order term in the Taylor expansion. But the, the end of the day is I used a Taylor expansion to compute Delta X, right? And Using that Taylor expansion, I predict some decrease in F. If that prediction from the Taylor expansion disagrees with what the actual function says, then I stepped too far. I stepped too far for the Taylor expansion to be valid. Does that make sense? That's like the end of the day intuition for this. I take a Taylor expansion about X. It tells me, you know, this direction is the best way to go. I take the step, but if my function's super wiggly, and that step, you know, stepped too far such that like third and fourth order terms in the Taylor expansion started to dominate, then this would be bad, right? Then I would get a strong disagreement here between the actual F and the Taylor expansion of F about the point X that I started at. You don't get delta X out of like Taylor expansion itself. Why well, I, I do. That's what Newton's method does, right? Newton's method is getting at delta X by solving the, the Taylor expansion, right? And then what I'm doing here is I'm taking the answer I got from the Taylor expansion, plugging it into the real nonlinear F, evaluating that and, and asking, does that agree with the Taylor approximation I used to compute the step? And the implication is if they disagree by a lot, then it means like the Taylor approximation is not valid anymore at that far out of that far out of a delta X. And then I should basically backtrack and shrink delta X until I get into a regime where the full nonlinear F agrees well with the Taylor approximation, right? So in, implicit in this, this is again, like this is these this method or the trust region thing that maybe some of you have heard of are basically like, at the end of the day, what they're saying is, can I trust the Taylor expansion? They're saying like, I'm going to check the real function at the end of my step against the Taylor expansion that I used to get the step. And if they don't agree, I, I say, I step too far. The Taylor expansion is no longer valid that far away. And I shouldn't trust this answer. And then I'm going to shrink until they agree relatively well within some tolerance. And that means, you know, cool, the Taylor expansion was relatively accurate. The step I got makes sense. Like I should, that's that's a safe move. Okay. That makes sense, everybody. Any other questions about this? Uh, beta is actually uh, smaller than one. You might have to think about this for a second, but yeah, it's, it's in general. So I'll, let me write this down, like what typical values for these things are. Uh, and now my iPad turned off. And my phone is ringing. Sorry, let me turn this off. Do not disturb. Cool. Okay, cool. So that's what's going on. Um, and then what we are going to do after we check, right? If it's not satisfied, 
we're going to shrink alpha and we're going to shrink it by some you know geometric factor which we'll call c this c is some scalar that's less than one right so it's shrinking and you're just multiplying it um and that's it and like we said we i made this argument right that as long as f is smooth for small enough delta x your alpha times delta x for small enough alpha these will agree because in the limit as alpha goes to zero like the first order challenge is all you need and it's basically exact right okay cool um so let me write some more stuff down so the intuition here which i've now said out loud it's hard to talk and write at the same time uh is to make sure that your step agrees with the linearization within some tolerance. Which is the beta. And typical values for those constants are um, C typically is one half. So you're just chopping the step size in half every time. And then B or beta, I changed to beta because of my bad handwriting. This is usually really really loose actually something like 10 to the fourth to maybe 0 0.1 so the, the idea there is right like you're saying i only care about this agreeing within like 10 percent. it's actually extremely loose tolerance um, but it turns out um like any non-zero value of beta uh will will like guarantee local convergence of this thing okay um questions yeah yeah Taking the difference of the integers and RHS and then putting a modular from that and comparing instead of doing the So this is assuming you're minimizing. Um, there are versions of this that take a norm. Um, but again, like assuming I'm minimizing um, and assuming like there's that kind of sign implicit in here where there's a decreasing, this works and you don't need the norm. And in fact, the norm condition here would be bad because it would allow you to take an uphill step, right? Which we definitely don't want which you could argue that's sort of taken care of by the regularization part, but like um, it's it just, this is a simpler condition, right? Than taking a norm. And so you don't need it because it's strictly minimizing. If that makes sense. So yeah, think through the norm thing and then think through it in the case where it's gotta be minimizing and that second term is always negative, right? If, if the gradient's negative, like, you know, whatever, you're going downhill, that thing's gotta be negative, right? Okay. Yeah. I mean, stare at it for a minute. I'm pretty sure that's right. But yeah, I might have messed it up. Uh, sorry, could you please repeat what is the use of beta in this? Beta is a tolerance that's saying, you know, how closely you have to agree with the first order Taylor expansion. So we are not changing that, right? Um, we are not. That's right. These are fixed parameters. These are like hyperparameters of the algorithm, and they're fixed around those values I just wrote down there. So okay. let's do it. Uh, so here's the stuff from last time. We'll just kind of quickly step through this. Hopefully this doesn't take forever. So same stuff as last time. I'm going to start it at the sort of annoying point from last time where it overshot with the regularization. So um, instead, right. So this was the no regularization version clearly does not work. Here's the regularized version that we got to last time. And this is where it sort of starts here and then dramatically overshoots, right? So now we're gonna do the line search. So here's backtracking regularized Newton. He's doing both tricks. Um, here's the regularization stuff from last time. And then here's the backtracking stuff. Um, oh yeah, that's why I used B instead of beta. I should go change the note. I used beta as the regularizer thing from last time. So I gotta you know, make, it should be a B. This is why it's a problem to do this on the fly. And I should not, I should avoid the temptation. I'm not quick enough to do it on my feet. Okay, so cool. B, not beta, that is why. Okay, so here we go. So regularization, and then here's just the line search we just talked about. So alpha starts at one. There's that Armijo condition we just wrote down. This is like, you know, the actual code from the pseudo code, right? It's straightforward. And then we do this until we, we get this condition to be satisfied. And then we take our step. Let's watch what happens. So we're doing the exact same starting point, exact same everything else. 
let's take a step here now. So now it goes, it, instead of overshooting, it goes downhill. You get a really nice descent step and, you know, take a couple more. There's two steps. There's three steps. We're there. Like, what'd you expect? Yeah. Zoom in on the code. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Can I do this? Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, are we good? Yeah. So I'll keep it there now. Thanks. All right. Anybody else? We keep trucking. Sure. Yeah. So if we initialize it to the correct place, like you did for the last, there would be no difference between what we will use further as opposed to this. If alpha is one, it exactly matches me. So it basically this kicks in only if you do something bad. Same with the regularization, right? These are like hacks to fix up like sort of bad corner cases, right? If you're in a good place and things are convex and whatever. Uh, these things don't do anything, right? You beta equals zero, alpha equals one forever. And in fact, the whole, like, we talked a little bit about how Newton's method converges quadratically. It turns out it only converges quadratically with these hacks turned off. So it, if you regularize and do a line search, whenever those those uh, things are, you know, not zero and one, whenever you're backtracking and regularizing, you actually lose your quadratic convergence rate. So this whole, like, quadratic convergence thing only really applies when you're close to the answer, when you're in the basin of attraction um, and you aren't doing that stuff anymore, right? So it exists. And the whole thing about basin of attraction, the idea is once I'm sufficiently close to the answer, the Taylor expansion is good, right? And then all these things drop out and go away and they don't matter anymore, right? So these are often called globalization strategies. There's things, there are things to fix. Newton works awesome if you're close to the answer. If you're far away, it can break down in these ways. These are ways of fixing it when it breaks down when you're far away. When you get close, you know, and the Taylor expansion actually agrees with the F, uh, then they they stop doing anything. Uh, I just think so for the reason that we should so we have uh, the decision step check the half, and then uh, let's say the minima lies somewhere between the half, like yeah. one and, and uh, like, let's say let's say zero point seven five yep. one. So it will just again. You'll just so take another step and get there the next step. Yeah. Um, so this is the cheapest thing, easiest thing to write down. Um, there are so-called, so there are many variants on these things. So another variant is called an exact line search. This is called a backtracking line search. We just chop it in half. The exact line search takes the Newton direction, plugs it into the function, and then solves a scalar optimization problem, a 1D optimization problem in alpha, and actually exactly minimizes F in that 1D direction along that, that over alpha, basically, right? Um, so you can do that. In fact, a lot of the convergence theory for like hard proofs of these things assume an exact line search, but no one does it in practice because it's super expensive, basically. All right. Anybody else? Cool. Yeah, if you got something. It's not literally backtracking. It's just it's the forward direction. It's like slicing. So yeah, I mean, it depends on what you mean by backtracking. It's literally just here's delta x. I'm going to then, you know, if that's bad, I'm going to go here yeah. and here. Right. That's it won't go behind. No, it won't go. It's 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 basically guaranteed to work for some finite uh alpha because of the whole Taylor expansion argument. As long as F is smooth, then with some sufficiently small alpha, it agrees with the Taylor expansion, right? So you'll never get to a negative value. Also, that thing just by it's always multiplied by half, right? Like it can't go negative. In the limit of like going around that loop a bajillion times, it'll converge to zero. So it never actually gets there, right? Cool. All right. C equals to, C equals to one over two a magic number or no no that's totally arbitrary like you can pick anything you want so if you want it to be you know like uh, more exact and like not have the this sort of undershoot thing you just talked about you want to make it closer to one right so you make it closer and you're doing a more fine grained search um, at a certain point it sort of becomes not worth it right uh, but this is just like kind of standard like what what is normal to do but you can do anything the other thing you can do which is a very good trick that some people do is you can just if you have lots of cores, lots of threads, you just sample over alpha and do them all. You can do all the line searches you want in parallel over n cores, right? And then you can get like very close to the exact answer for like basically free if you got a lot of cores to burn. That's another trick. Yeah. Oh yeah, so this is evaluating this guy for different alphas, right? It's finding the alpha. And then this, once you kick out of this while loop, you've got the right alpha. And then this is where you apply the delta X with alpha. Cool. Um, you guys should definitely play around with the code. That's how I post this stuff. So go mess around and like try your own weird stuff and, you know, play, play around, do weird things.
try stuff. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so the summary takeaway there is that, so basically with those two tricks, with regularizing and line search, you're good. And there's a bunch of theory on this that we're not gonna cover, um, but like more or less with those tricks, you're essentially like guaranteed to find a local minimum. And again, caveat, you know, non-convex, blah, blah, blah. You're not going to find a global optimum. But, you know, from a given starting point, if you play these tricks and, you know, the function is super, super terrible, you're going to eventually land in some kind of local optimum. That's like the closest one to where you started. Yeah. Uh, oh, sure. Isn't the email expansion There's no delta x. Okay. Um, this is the, yeah, there's a trick in here. Uh, this is basically the delta x under the first order expansion, unless I messed this up. There's a trick that shows up in here. Did I do this wrong? I may have a bug in there. I'm going to have to get back to you on this. Oh, this is because it's a scalar function. This is like a kind of a dumb, I probably should make this more explicit. In the vector case, this doesn't work. But in the scalar case, this is like sort of okay. Yeah, bug me later about that. Slash, I should probably make the code more clear and not play games in special cases. Uh, so, okay, so Newton with a couple of hacks, um, both of which are quite simple and cheap to implement. Uh, which we call the term of art for these are globalization strategies. Um, is basically very effective. Uh, at, at getting your local uh, optimum. Uh, again, yeah, like basically with minor, you know, technical caveats, like it's the thing to do. It's kind of the gold standard. If you have a smooth problem that's small enough to compute the Hessian and factorize it, do this every time. All right, cool. Any final questions on this stuff before we get into some, yeah, new material? Yeah, so the globalization thing is, comes down to the fact that like, the naive Newton's method is only valid in some small neighborhood, some like epsilon ball of the optimum where all those Taylor expansion things kind of work out. So this is called globalization because it basically trying to get it to work outside that like epsilon ball, but it's not the global optimum. There's a lot of tricky language around here. If you actually go read the literature on nonlinear optimization, um, there'll, there'll be these results they call you know, global convergence results. And you think that means converge to the global optimum. That is not what they mean. When, when they when you hear the words global convergence with regard to your nonlinear optimization, what they mean is that it's guaranteed to converge to a local optimum globally from anywhere you start, which is a very annoying and very tricky thing if you're not in the field. <laughs> All right, cool. Here we go. Time to talk about equality constraints. Who's done this before? I expect like a decent number. Like maybe half-ish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here's what we're doing now. We've got min of our f of x, just like before, where x um, is a scalar valued function. So e to vector spits out a scalar. This is not our dynamic function, to be super clear. That's what I'm trying to avoid there. Um, subject to some constraint c of x equals zero. And the c of x is potentially a vector valued function. So this guy is like rn to say rn. And when I say vector value, all that literally means is you have a bunch of scalar constraints and you stack them up. And this is just an easier way to write that. Cool. Okay. So now we're going to get into these things called 
first order necessary conditions. So that word literally just means set the gradient equal to zero. It's what we did before in the unconstrained case. The first order means first derivative, right? <laughs> necessary means this has to be true, but it's not sufficient. Like this is what we did last time, right? That's just the fancy math words you'll hear for this. And in this case, you know, they're a little more involved than, you know, grad equals zero that we saw before. Okay, so this is extremely intuitive, but I think like there's some like gymnastics involved in the math that, that make it less intuitive. So I'm gonna tell you the intuitive plain English version first, and then we're gonna do the math version. So the intuitive version is that we need, so we have a constraint. Remember before it was just grad f equals zero, boom. So intuitively what we need now, so there's a constraint is that we need grad f to equal zero, in the free directions. When I say free, I mean the unconstrained directions, the directions you can actually move, right? So if it's constrained in some direction, I can't do anything about that. So I don't need the gradient to be zero in that direction. Make sense? Yeah. So that's the deal. And then the second thing we need is we need the constraints satisfied. <laughs> sort of obviously. So it's just that first one. Basically what we got to do is take the gradient and like what we really want to do is basically take the gradient and project out the constrained directions and then that thing has to be zero. That makes sense, right? Okay, so we're going to draw a picture. Hopefully my my art my art is not good. Apologies in advance. I will try to draw straight lines and stuff. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to draw, right now I'm going to draw level curves of an F and like quadratic bowl, okay? So it's a bunch of circles. So these are sort of level curves of our F uh, where, you know, we're looking down and the minimum's at the origin, right? I'm just doing this, it's cool. And I'm going to draw now also the um, line for C of X equals zero. And that we're going to do here. So like, this, I'm trying to make this as easy as possible. So this guy is C of X equals zero. Um, and then, you know, the level curves of F. Let's see. Cool. So far, so good. And then to be, you know, we're going to draw some more stuff here to sort of try to clarify the picture. So we've got, you know, if those are the level curves and, you know, minimums at the, the origin, the gradient of F is always pointing out radially, right? Grad F. Zach, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, could you formalize what you mean by uh, gradient at a direction? Gradient is defined at a point. Uh, what's a gradient in a direction? It's the, the components of the gradient in those directions, right? It's a vector and, you know, each component is in a some direction, right? Uh, I see. Okay. Um, so basically what I'm saying is like the components of the gradients that lock in the directions that are you're free to move in, those have to be zero. That makes sense? Uh, yeah, I get it now. Okay, thanks. Cool, cool. So, okay. So in our little picture, uh, so, so far so good. And then the other thing we need is the gradient of C here. So this is, you know, intuitively it's the, the normal direction to the constraint, right? The direction, so if C equals zero is the, the curve, I, that's the thing I need to be satisfied. Away from that line, right? C is increasing or decreasing. And the gradient of C here is going to be normal to the constraint always, right? So this is, say, grad C. And here, right, to be super clear, we've got F of X, which is from R2 to R. It's a 2D vector spits out a scalar. And, it, you know, in this situation, I've got a constraint also that's R2 to R, because I can't have any more than that, because I'm only in 2D. And, it, you know, I can only constrain one dimension before I have no, nowhere left to go, right? which is also another way of thinking about that whole free directions thing, right? If I made C R2 to R2, like a 2D constraint, and I'm stuck at a point, I can't do anything. So it doesn't matter what the gradient is, right? Cool. Okay, so that's, hopefully that's clear. That's the picture. And now I'm gonna like try to sort of, we're gonna take a couple steps away from this, the number one statement, right? I, which I think is pretty intuitive, zero in the free directions, right? And we're gonna try to bootstrap from there, like the math version of this, which if you haven't, you know, like thought through it like this. It's it's not necessarily super clear intuitively what's going on. Okay, so 
so I'm going to say this another way. So any non-zero, this is basically the dual statement of number one, any non-zero component of grad F must be normal to the constraint service. And if you're fancy, you call these manifolds, right? This is the like n-dimensional idea of a surface. We call it hypersurface if you want, whatever. Uh, okay, so does that make sense to you guys? So like, let's chew on that for a minute. If anyone has questions, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, level set, level curves, right? What I'm drawing there, like, you know, uh, I don't know, topo map, right? You draw these curves of equal altitude, whatever. That's what those are. So zeros at the bottom, and those are like doing this, right? So I'm trying to draw a bowl from the top down. Okay, so let's think about this. So I need grad F to be zero in the free directions. The sort of like dual statement that means exactly the same thing is that anything that's not zero has to be perpendicular to the constraint surface. The reason is, right, the constraint surface is where I'm allowed to move. The solution's got to be on that C of X equals zero. It's got to be on that line. So if the gradient has any component parallel to the line, it means I could make progress, you know, going downhill on the objective by sliding on my line, right? So if the gradient of F is perpendicular to C, it means, you know, if I want to get any lower, I have to leave C of X equals zero. I have to leave the constraint surface, right? So does that make sense to everybody? So these are literally the same, they're saying the exact same thing. They're like mathematically identical statements. One is talking about, you know, free directions. The other one's talking about what has to be true in the sort of non-free directions or whatever, right? Okay, everyone cool with this? Okay, so now if you're cool with that and the fact that that means the same thing as number one, then I'm going to just write the math down for that. So what that, you know, an equivalent statement then is grad F uh, plus some scalar lambda times grad C has to equal zero for some lambda in R. So this thing, which I'm sure you know everyone's at least seen at some point, is called a Lagrange multiplier. Or a dual variable. And if you think about it for a second, literally that equation just says that grad F and grad C are parallel to each other. That's all it says, right? So lambda is some constant, scalar constant. So that's letting me rescale these things such that I can get that equation to equal zero, right? So this is just a statement of these things are parallel to each other, which is what that says, which is also what number one says. They all mean the same thing. Okay. Any questions? Is this making sense? I hope so. Okay. Okay. So this was the scalar case. Who's seen Lagrange multipliers before? Hopefully, like just about everyone. Yeah, yeah, cool. So this is like what it really means, right? It's this number one thing is the intuitive thing. And this is just like a mathematical way of writing that number one statement down, right? And I introduced this like extra thing to like, that's that literally just means parallel vectors, right? That's what that line means, which is the, the dual version of that first statement. Okay, I'll stop talking about that. Sounds like you guys get the idea. Okay, so this, right, we just did this like scalar case or like 2D, whatever, scalar you know, constraint function, 1D constraint function. So the general case where everything are vectors looks like this. It's the same, same thing. I'm just like kind of doing the n-dimensional version. And then lambda is a vector, which is dimension equal to the sort of output dimension of C. So lambda has the size of like the number of constraints for the, the size of C, right? The number of constraints in there. Cool. Does that make sense, everybody? Same thing, just like the vector version, right? Okay, so now we're just going to make stuff up. The rest of this is totally made up. This is the intuition and like the real stuff, the geometry. Now this is just a bunch of definitions that are standard in the field that like you should know about, but it's, you know, not actually important. It's just like, yeah, words. Okay, cool. So now we make stuff up. So based on this whole picture we just drew, based on this gradient condition, we're going to define this thing, this function 
L, which we call the Lagrangian, that is the objective function F that we're trying to minimize, plus lambda times the constraint function. Um, and then this right, is called the Lagrangian. And the reason we make this function up is that it lets us play the nice notational trick where you just set, like originally we just set grad of F equal to zero. If you make up this new L function, you can just set grad L with respect to everything equal to zero. So it like lets you pretend the constrained case looks the same as the unconstrained case. So that's like why this is a thing, basically. So we get grad X of L, which if I like actually expand that out, looks like grad F plus partial C partial x transpose lambda this has to equal zero and then grad l respect to lambda which just gives me back the constraint right this is lambda times c so this is just c of x this also has to equal zero sort of trivially right so it's just all the notation thing like not super deep and then this whole thing with the lagrangian and these two sets of conditions these have a name they show up a lot um, these are called KKT conditions. And there's like a slightly fancier version of these when we get to inequality constraints, which we're going to see in a second. And technically, the KKT conditions are the first order necessary conditions when you're with inequalities. But in practice, everyone calls this KKT conditions as well. And like, whatever. So we'll just call it KKT conditions. Okay. Questions about this? Yeah. Nope. Nope. First order necessary. They are literally the first order necessary conditions for constrained optimization problems. There are so called second order sufficiency conditions on top of these, but the KKT conditions are just this. They're specifically the case where you have inequalities as well, which we're going to do in a minute. Um, cool. Everyone good? Yeah. All right. So now, unsurprisingly, we're going to use Newton's method to solve this guy because that's our game. Uh, so so we're going to just compute some Taylor expansion stuff. No big deal. So here's, again, these are the things we're trying to, you know, get to be zero. So it's a root finding problem on grad L, right? Just like before, instead of a root finding problem on grad F. So we're going to write that all down. So we got a Taylor expand now with both x and lambda. So x plus delta x, lambda plus delta lambda. And this is approximately first order Taylor expansion, right? Um, uh, grad x of L plus the uh, derivative with respect to x, which in this case, it's the derivative of the gradient, right? So it's the Hessian of L now. So right like this, times delta X. And also, right, the derivative of this with respect to lambda, which is going to end up being this like mixed partial thing. So it's D squared L DX D lambda times delta lambda equals zero. If you stare at that second term, the mixed partial term, can anyone tell me what that is real quick? Looking up here. Hmm? So look, yeah, look at this. Oh, I can't reach this. Let me see. Can anyone tell me what that is? Just by like eyeballing that really quick. Yeah, you got it. So it's partial C, partial X transpose, right? It's just that second term up there from the cool. So this guy is just your constraint Jacobian, right? This is partial C, partial X transpose. Okay, and now we're going to do the same thing on the, the lower line. So we got grad respect to lambda of same stuff. And this one, um, it's just C of X, right? So it doesn't depend on lambda at all. So there's no lambda dependence, and it's just C of X plus partial C, partial X times delta X equals zero. So those are our like Newton conditions. And we solved those jointly, those two lines for delta X and delta lambda. And everything kind of proceeds as normal. 
Um, what else is there to say? And so, right. So from last time, right, to be clear, what we're going to do to do this is that line says C of X plus partial C partial X times delta X equals zero. We solve that for delta X, right? So we solve both of them, but um, like, so to be super clear, like the idea here is I'm going to move stuff around to solve this. So I get partial C partial X times delta X equals minus C of X, right? And then that's a linear system, like AX equals B. I, you know, like invert the Jacobian or whatever, if you like, and solve for the delta X, right? That's the game, like we've been doing before. So I'm now going to write this out, this whole Newton step, because there's like some special stuff going on in that. So the Newton step looks like this. We've got the Hessian of the Lagrangian. We've got partial C, partial X transpose up here. And then the second row is, remember, no lambda dependency, partial C, partial X. And then this last block is zero because the constraint doesn't have any lambda dependence. So that's the matrix we're trying to you know, invert or whatever. And then we're trying to solve for delta X, delta lambda. And the right-hand side is going to be minus grad of L respect to X. And the bottom is minus grad of L respect to lambda, which is just the constraint C of X, right? So there you go. So I just like stack this up into a matrix vector thing, but it's just what I wrote up there, right? Everyone cool with that? So I move some stuff over to the right, get a nice little matrix equation. It's exactly stock Newton for root finding, but applied to the KKT conditions. And I made up this new function called the Lagrangian. Yeah. Uh, which one? The line after Newton. Yeah, so that's um, this grad X L has to equal zero. I just took that and I Taylor expanded it in delta X delta lambda. Yeah, you got to do it in both, right? I have to solve it for both X and lambda. So I'm always doing this in both X and lambda. But if you just stack X and lambda into like one vector and think about it as like Z, then literally this is just grad of L with respect to Z equals zero. It's stock like Newton stuff in the joint vector of x and lambda i'm just like expanding it out and giving you more detail here because there's some actual like interesting stuff in the details okay so this thing shows up all the time in like multiple different fields this matrix this linear system where you have a matrix that looks like this where you have like a hessian block and then like a couple jacobians where it's so this matrix right just looking at it is symmetric right the hessian's got to be symmetric because hessian's got to be symmetric and then the Jacobians show up sort of transposed on either side. And then it's got the zero block. So it's symmetric. And it has some, it turns out some other interesting properties. And this is called a KKT system. Well, I guess this whole thing is called a KKT system. The, the whole linear system, right? Is a KKT system. The matrix will, we will call just a KKT matrix. But these things show up all over the place. They show up in dynamics, they show up in control, they show up in you know optimization, blah, 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 all these kind of adjacent fields. And they are um, they are uber, uber common. And so it's, it turns out they're so common that there are highly specialized linear algebra uh, you know, uh, algorithms for solving exactly that linear system because it shows up all over the place. It basically is all of optimization. So people spend a lot of time figuring out how to like really efficiently solve these, what, they're, what are called symmetric indefinite linear systems. Okay, cool. Um, there's one last little thing I want to show be before we show off the code for this. Um, so that's Newton's method. I now want to like briefly mention this thing called Gauss-Newton. Has anyone heard of this? Okay. Can anyone tell me what this is? Yeah, I won't torture you. I'll just tell you what it is. Okay, so... Um, I'm now going to zoom in on that Hessian term. So the top left block in the matrix, we're going to try to write that out, what that actually is, right? So it's D squared L, DX squared. And if I go look at the definition of L, it's got like, you know, grad F in there, or it's got F and it's got the constraint stuff, right? So what I'm literally doing is taking the derivative of this guy with respect to X, right? So the first term I'm going to get is del squared F, but then I'm going to get this really annoying second term that involves the Hessian of the constraints. Why is that annoying? Does anyone have any thoughts on why this might be annoying? 
What size is this thing? Yeah, you end up with a third rank tensor, which is annoying. Um, okay, so let's write it down. So we're going to get del squared F, and I'm going to write this in kind of a weird way to avoid writing out the tensor stuff. I'm just write it like this. There's also a hint buried in here, though. So this thing is um, this like tensor term, right? This is the most annoying part of computing a Newton step, it turns out, or one of the most annoying parts, uh, because it's got this like third rank tensor stuff. And it, if, you, if you're naive about this and you try to go compute, you know, like the tensor sort of Hessian of your constraints, this can be extremely expensive, right? Um, there is a hint there though. Uh, it turns out if you use like smart, clever, modern automatic differentiation techniques, you can actually compute that for like no extra cost. Um, and the trick is you diff through the matrix vector product. So if you guys are familiar with like, you know, how all these auto diffing things work, uh, this, this is like called a, a pullback or something. Right? If you've seen this in these toolboxes. So the idea is if you directly diff the matrix vector product and you have like a good auto diffing library, you never build the tensor explicitly and, and therefore like things are okay. But if you are hand coding this, it's a, it's a huge pain and you generally don't do it. So historically, people often just leave this thing out And this is so common that it has a name. And, uh, you know, apparently Gauss came up with it first. So we drop this second. Um, this is sometimes called the constraint curvature. Term. Does that make sense, everybody? Curvature, because like, you know, partial C, partial X is fitting a line to the constraint, right? So the next derivative is going to be like this quadratic term that has curvature, so constraint curvature, whatever. And when you do it, it's called Gauss-Newton. Um, so there's some like technical stuff about this. Basically, it's cheaper and it's very popular and you should probably just do it. Um, the like theory stuff says this has slightly slower convergence than Newton. Um, so that means you know you need more iterations to solve. But the per iteration cost is cheaper. So often this wins in wall clock time. Okay, now we're gonna do some stuff. Uh, I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, so is Gauss, uh, so when we drop the second term, so if our uh, C, our constraint is uh, basically, if it is linear, is it, is it equivalent to solving Newton directly? Sorry, so solving Newton what? Uh, is it equivalent to solving with Newton method directly instead of Gauss-Newton? Um, if your constraints that second are, yeah, term... coincide. that's exactly right. Another way of thinking about it is this is equivalent to linearizing the constraints first and then doing Newton with linearized constraints. So yeah, you're totally right. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so now we're going to do this. So here we go. Um, awesome. So, so I'm going to make up some functions. Um, I'm going to make up a quadratic, you know, uh, objective function. And I'll plot this in a second. I'm also going to make up a constraint function C. To make things more interesting, I'm not going to do a linear constraint like I drew in my cartoon. I'm going to make it a nonlinear constraint because, you know, life is nonlinear. Um, and we're going to plot this, the landscape, you know, plot like I drew by hand. Okay, so here's level curves of your F, that's the bowl, and then this uh, yellow guy is my constraint manifold, constraint surface, whatever you want to call it, I guess constraint line in this situation, and the idea is I've, I want to minimize F, but I have to stay on this guy. So intuitively, what's going to happen, right, is I'm going to try to get as close as I can to the bottom of the bowl, on this curve. So the answer is going to be somewhere around here, just intuitively, right? Cool. 
All right, so let's try this. So here's my Newton step. This is exactly what I just wrote down. So here's this, this Hessian of Lagrangian. It's got Hessian of the ejective plus annoying tensor term. And I'm doing the clever auto diff trick here where I take the Jacobian of the like, you know, matrix vector product. So I never form the tensor explicitly. So this isn't too bad to compute. Uh, and then here's my Jacobian. Oh yeah, I should say, I wrote, I hand wrote the Jacobians here because they're easy and, you know, and the Hessian of this guy. Cool. So I don't have to auto diff those. I wrote them out by hand. I am auto diffing this one because it's annoying to do by hand. Uh, what else? Cool. And then here's my KKT system. That's that symmetric matrix we just did. Here's the right-hand side vector, right? All good. Um, I solve the linear system for, you know, the stacked, you know, X and Lambda together. And I just pull out the Delta X, Delta Lambda and apply the step. I'm cool with that. All right, so let's do this uh, with some guess. So let's say I, I make an initial guess here. Cool. Um, and again, the answer we expect to be like somewhere over here. Let's try it. So cool. So intuitively what happened here is that, remember, I linearized the constraint. So I'm taking, really what I'm doing is I'm taking a Newton step uh, along the constraint, the linearized constraint surface. So I basically went to the bottom along that line tangent to my nonlinear constraint. Let's take another step and see what happens. So now it sort of, you know, pulled me back towards the constraint manifold. And if I run this a couple more iterations, we get the expected result, right? So same kind of, you know, fast convergence, three, four iterations, and I can get, you know, it, this like machine precision, nice answer, exactly where we expected. I should say one of the other big advantages of Newton over fixed point iteration slash gradient descent is Newton can handle arbitrary nonlinear constraints like this really well and just like nail them exactly. And it's really hard to deal with constraints in first order gradient descent type methods. So yet another sort of selling point. Okay, any questions about that? Yeah. Exactly what we're going to do now. Uh, cool. So let me go drop that term and see what happens. Cool. Everyone agree that's the, the right move. Okay, so we're starting in the same spot. It took, what, four iterations last time? Let's see what happens. So same behavior, basically, qualitatively. Um, one, two, you know, three, four. Cool. It's like basically did exactly the same thing. It won't always do that. Like you'll get into situations, you know, sometimes where it'll take like one or two extra iterations, basically. But that's kind of the normal thing. It'll take a couple more iterations than than full Newton. Nothing like super dramatic. Yeah. So does it, so this is basically like dependent on the smoothness of your constraint function. It's specifically dependent on the nonlinearity, right? So remember what I'm doing is I'm assuming in the Gauss Newton approximation, I'm assuming the constraints actually linear. I drop the second derivative of the constraint term, right? So it really depends on how big the second derivative of your constraint is, aka constraint curvature, right? So if the curvature is small, if it's like near linear, then it, Gauss Newton's a very, very good approximation. It works great. The more curvy and you know wiggly your constraint surface gets, the worse that that approximation gets, and like kind of the, the worse your convergence will get. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So now we're gonna play a more fun game. <clears throat> so I'm gonna put this back. Regular Newton, and I'm going to change the starting point to something a little farther away. So now I'm going to start up here. And so like intuitively what should happen, right, is I'm going to kind of like, you know, go like this, blah, 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 and hopefully like kind of make my way around to here. Make sense? Let's try that. Let's take some steps and see what happens. Uh, oh, that wasn't the step. That, this is the step. Okay, so that makes sense. Looks good. Let's do it again. Pretty good, head the right direction. Let's do it again. Seems reasonable, still going kind of the right way. Ooh, what happened there? Uh-oh, I went backwards, back up. What do we think's happening here? And so now I'm like converging to this point over here, which is neither a minimizer of anything nor satisfies the constraints exactly. I'm getting stuck. Badness. Okay. Thoughts. Why? When did we go uphill before? Yeah. 
when the Hessian had a negative eigenvalue, right? When the Hessian sort of had weird curvature. Okay. Well, my objective function is a quadratic bowl. The Hessian's super nice. I hand wrote it, right? No negative eigenvalues in there. So how did this happen? No. So is the Hessian in Newton's method the Hessian of F? No. So the Hessian of F is nice. Are you, is the gradient tangent or um, perpendicular to the linearized? Um, it's not that. No. So it, it's this Hessian thing. Is there someone over here had a, yeah, yeah. So basically, we're not using the Hessian of F here. Remember, we got the second term, which is like this weird curvature of the constraints thing. We get a nonlinear constraint. So even if the Hessian of F is nice, which it is here, the Hessian of the Lagrangian with that second term can do nasty things to you. So let's go check that out. So here's the full Hessian. Check it out, negative eigenvalue. So the constraint curvature term can do this to you, in which case you need to regularize anyway. So this is basically another argument for doing Gauss-Newton. Gauss-Newton basically guarantees that like they, this doesn't happen, right? Because I just dropped that other term. So let's try that. I actually coded that up separately, weirdly. So let's, let's do that again. So same stuff, but now Gauss-Newton, where I dropped the second term. Right? I just took it out here. Um, exact same st starting point. So that was what happened before, exactly the same. Pretty much the same thing that happened before. But now I keep going in the right direction. <laughs> and I kind of like gradually crawl my way around the bottom of the bowl and like end up at the right spot in like say five, six iterations, right? Now I'm converged, cool. Okay, so in addition to this like, you know, being cheaper thing, uh, Gauss-Newton also in cases where the objective function is nice, even if the constraints are nasty, your Hessian here will still stay nice, which is a good thing, right? So that's like sort of another win. Another way of saying this is if, if your Hessian is getting regularized because of this kind of effect, you're basically might as well be doing Gauss-Newton because when you, as soon as you regularize, right, you're losing your fast Newton conversion stuff. So if you have to regularize anyway, you might as well just drop that second term and like it's cheaper and it's not going to have that problem. So I think, you know, the takeaway here is sort of Gauss-Newton generally a good thing. Okay, anyone want me to try anything else? Any other questions about this? Yeah. I guess, are there any places where you want Yeah, there definitely are, right? There's no, this is like, there's no free lunch. Like there are caveats to everything. I would say in control in robotics, the Gauss-Newton thing is like standard. Basically everyone does it. And it's kind of for these reasons, but there are absolutely cases where it will break and where you want the full Hessian and stuff like that. So there's no, <laughs> in general, there are no general rules. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like I don't know the physical version of this that we're gonna do in you know here is that like the f is your you know cost function and then this c of x is your dynamics like your robot dynamics and so those are always nonlinear so you always have this like flavor to it right um, there's definitely other examples I could give for like like these things have like infinite physical versions right that's the one that's like relevant to us I suppose you know it's not very satisfying. I don't know. Hopefully that. Okay. Cool. All right. So let's write some stuff down. Unlock. Okay. Cool. So that was that. We did this example. Um, so just in case you go back and try this yourself, which you should, and plug in your own stuff. We started here, life was good, and we did, you know, this one, and bad things happened. All right. So, take away messages from that whole conversation are, um, the first one is you, you might still need to regularize the Hessian of the Lagrangian in this thing. Uh, 
uh, even if you know Hessian of the adjective is nice. So that's kind of annoying. Um, and then the other sort of takeaway summary thing is that Gauss Newton is often used in practice. Um, I would go so far as to say that it is the standard uh, in like optimal control and robotics. Like Bessie Ogren does this. Okay, cool. Any remaining questions about that whole thing? Before we turn the page, so to speak. Go back up. Yeah. What does that say after uh, a wall clock time? Yeah, like. Actual runtime. Better. Sorry? Wall clock time, like runtime, actual runtime, not iteration count. Right. So the, the saying, like what, what we mean there is that, you know, Gauss Newton takes more iterations to converge because it's like, you know, less accurate approximation, but the iterations are cheaper. So each iteration is much cheaper. So therefore, even if it takes a couple more iterations, if each iteration is much faster in terms of actual runtime, wall clock time, um, it's it's often gets you the answer faster. Okay, cool. All right, well, last topic of the night, which um, hopefully we can get in. So we're going to do inequality constraints now. Um, all right, so here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to do min f of x, same deal. But now it's going to be subject to c of x less than equal to zero instead of c of x equal to zero. And for this discussion, like uh, we're just going to do inequalities by themselves. In general, when you have both, which you pretty much always will, um, you do the inequality stuff and you just smush it together with the equality conversation we just had. You just do both things at the same time and it's it all works right. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do now is write down the first order necessary conditions for this guy, just like we did last time. And uh, uh, what am I doing? First order necessary conditions. And um, they look the same in plain English. Uh, we want grad f to equal zero in the three directions. And we need uh, the constraints to be satisfied also. That's it. Same story. So where it gets weird is in like writing down the first one because before free directions was like, you know, any, any way you wanted to point. Um, now there's like a one-sidedness to this thing, right? So like when I say free directions, it's okay. Like if I have an equality constraint, like this is, this is always illegal, right? This way or this way on the constraint surface. Now with this inequality thing, there's a one-sided nature to it where, you know, this might be legal, but this one's not, right? So that's what makes this more complicated. And everything we're about to do is just to basically massage the math to get at that. It's this like one-sided thing, right? So it's essentially we're going to clip things like so they're one-sided versus what we had before. Okay, I'm going to write them down and then I'm going to talk about them a lot. And so here's here we go. So the first thing is it looks really similar to what we had before. In fact, is the same. So partial C, partial X, transpose lambda equals zero. So that's gradient equals zero. And it looks exactly the same, right, as what we had before. Cool. Um, then um, we have like 
basically the same same thing again as last time. Uh, but you know, inequality instead of equality. Cool constraints have to be satisfied. Now it gets weird. Um, let me like write down the names for these things also. These have names, each line. This is called stationarity, which is, you know, stationary point, fixed point, gradient equals zero point, right? Kind of that kind of idea. This one is called primal feasib feasibility. And like if you unpack that, feasible means obeys the constraint and primal refers to X as opposed to lambda. Remember we said lambda is called a dual variable. So in optimization, the Lagrange multipliers, the lambdas are called dual variables and the original you know, decision variables X are called primal variables. So that's what that means. It just means that the, you know, the X is feasible, primal feasibility. Now here's the new stuff or weird stuff. Let me write these down and then we can talk about like what they're actually about. So this is our Lagrange multiplier. And unlike last time, last time lambda could be anything, right? It could have either sign in particular. And that, that was the idea of like, you, could, you couldn't go in either direction here. What we're doing now is we're forcing lambda to be positive. And that's getting you the one-sided thing. Cool? So this is called dual feasibility. Cool. So feasibility means respects constraint. Dual refers to the lambda. And then the last one, um, there's actually several ways of writing this. Uh, I will write it uh, a couple of different ways. Let me write it like maybe the most legit way, which is the following. Lambda times C of X. I'll explain what that means in a sec. Um, does anyone know what that means? A little circle with a dot. It's called the Hadamard product. Anyone heard of that? It's just element-wise product of two vectors. So I have two vectors. I just do element-wise multiplication and like the output's the same size as, as the original stuff. Um, there's another way to write this though. So I want that to equal zero. Turns out that's exactly the same as writing lambda transpose C of X equals zero. So I could just take the dot product and that also has to equal zero. In this case, it turns out that works. Okay, so you'll see this written both ways. There's actually even another way to write this whole thing that you might come across. These are the two most common ones. So if you see that weird circle dot thing, that's what it means, element wise product. But you'll also see the lambda transpose C thing. Um, and this thing is called complementarity. And this whole set of stuff, um, these are called all together the KKT conditions. And these are sort of the real KKT conditions with those extra things, right? Um, people kind of overload that name to also mean the, the equality only case, but it's really this in general. Okay, so now I'm gonna try to give you some intuition for what these equations are doing so that like, you know, it really is just number one. This is just how you write that down in equations. Okay, so let's try to talk through what they're doing. So let's think about a couple of special cases. So the first special case I want you to think about is the case where we know the constraint is active. What I mean by that is you're on the constraint surface such that C of X equals zero, right? If, I'm, if I have an active constraint, meaning C of X strictly equals zero, then um, if that's true, then according to these equations, if C of X equals zero, then looking at the bottom row, the complementarity thing, what happens to lambda? Well, I guess that's not the right way to say this. Basically, if C, if C is non-zero, then lambda has to be zero. That's what that last thing is doing. If C is equal to zero, then lambda can be non-zero. So that last line, the complementarity thing, is literally just encoding switching. It's saying only one or the other of the constraint or the multiplier can be non-zero at a time, right? And it's element-wise. Um, so any particular constraint in there and the corresponding Lagrange multiplier, you can only have one or the other non-zero. So in the case where C is zero, so I'm up on the constraint surface, then I have, you know, lambda is allowed to take on a non-zero value. And this is the same exact situation I have in just the pure equality constrained situation. Yeah. 
there also a case where the unsubstantiation is not used to be at three x equals zero? Yeah, zero? that's evil, and we shall not talk about that. <laughs> that's called weak complementarity, and there's a whole bunch of like down the rabbit hole badness that can happen there, uh, which you probably know about that we're going to not talk about today. <laughs> but yes, thank you for, uh, you know, derailing my whole story. <laughs> Kevin knows too much. <laughs> That's why he's a good TA. He'll he'll tell you all the things that I'm glossing over and like, you know, whatever. I try not to like, you know, generally I try not to lie to you. That wasn't a lie. It was more an omission. <laughs> um, okay, so, and then the other case, not the Kevin case, um, if the constraint is inactive. That means that C of X is strictly less than zero. So off the constraint, then I get that Lambda has to equal zero. And this looks exactly like the unconstrained case because basically that switch there turned off Lambda and turned off the entire constraint thing in the Lagrangian. So it doesn't exist in there anymore, right? So basically what you're going, this, all this like weird math is basically the, the last line of the complementarity thing is basically put, putting a switch on the equality constraints such that if you're on the constraint surface, it turns it on. So it's now looks like an equality constraint in those equations. If you're off the constraint surface. The complementarity condition effectively turns the constraint off such that it looks like the unconstrained case. And like, if you stack it all up, you get this like nice system of things that like encodes that on off switching of constraints. Um, and if you kind of think through the logic of what's going on there, it's basically this on off switching stuff. Okay. Any questions about this? Yeah. Sorry, say that again. Yeah. So, so first off, lambda has to be non negative, right? Um, we wrote that down. That's like part of its setup that, that is important. So, this last equation. The last one, the complementarity that says, just think about the scalar case for a second. It says C times lambda has to equal zero, right? So what it's saying is if C is zero, then lambda could be anything. If lambda is zero, C can be anything, but like vice versa, but you can't have them both be non-zero. One or the other has to be zero. And that basic right there, that just encodes this like on-off switching of the equality constraints basically in there. And yes, there is the corner case, which might happen in your life at some point, which is this so where where just magically you can write down like a particularly nasty problem where like the constraint manifold passes through the unconstrained minimum of F, right? And if that happens, then you'll be in this situation where they can both be zero, where you basically what that is, right, is the, the unconstrained minimum was on the constraint manifold such that um, you're on the constraint manifold but you didn't need the Lagrange multiplier to be there, right? In which case they can both be zero. This is sort of a corner case that like almost never happens in practice unless you like write a problem down such that it happens. But it's generally not worth worrying about. It does create some like nastiness that you have to deal with. Um, but we're gonna like sort of just like pretend that doesn't happen for now. If anyone wants to know more about that, we can talk about it offline. Uh, okay, cool. So then this guy, is the same as the unconstrained case. And there you go. Um, so let's see. So the takeaway is that like complementarity encodes this like on and off switching. Okay, questions about that? So we're gonna do some stuff, more stuff on this next time.